what is this much-studied dialogue, the Mino, about? It presents itself as a dialogue about virtue. The main characters are Socrates, who is, as usual, ready to shoot down ill-considered answers to philosophical questions, and an interlocutor, Mino. There are also guest appearances by a slave boy and Anaitis, one of the men responsible for Socrates being put on trial and executed. But it's Mino who gives most of the ill-considered answers. He also kicks off the dialogue by asking this question I've been talking about, can virtue be taught? Socrates responds predictably by protesting that he can't say whether virtue is teachable because he doesn't know what virtue is. Perhaps Mino can help him out by giving him a definition of virtue, and then they'll be able to figure out together whether it's teachable. You don't have to have read too many of Plato's Socratic dialogues to know what's coming. Mino will propose some definitions of virtue, Socrates will show that the definitions aren't good ones, and in the end they'll be stuck in puzzlement, what in Greek was called aporia, which means something like an impasse or unsolved problem. This, in fact, is exactly what happens in the first part of the dialogue. Mino is confident that he can say what virtue is, because he is a student of the sophist Gorgias, whom we've seen in previous episodes. Mino recites a version of what he's heard from Gorgias, saying that each kind of person has their own kind of virtue. For instance, the virtue of a man is to be capable in politics, whereas the virtue of a woman is to look after the house. Women's liberation was still a few millennia in the future, although as we'll see when we get to the Republic, Plato was ahead of the curve on this topic, as on so many others. Socrates objects to Mino's answer, complaining that this isn't a definition of virtue, but rather a list of the types of virtue. What we want to know is what do all the types have in common? This, along with several other exchanges between Socrates and Mino in this part of the dialogue, asks us to focus on the question of what would be a good definition. That's typical of the dialogue as a whole. We think we are going to get a discussion of virtue, and to some extent we do, but we get something perhaps more important, namely a reflection on what it would be to know about virtue. Would knowing what virtue is be the same thing as giving a good definition of virtue? If so, what are good definitions like? They aren't just lists, like the one Mino gave. They also aren't circular, like another definition Mino attempts when he says that virtue is getting good things in a just way. But justice is a virtue, so he's effectively saying that virtue is getting good things virtuously. Not very helpful. Notice that these points would apply not just to virtue, but to anything we might want to define. If I am asked to define podcast, it's not much use if I give you a list of podcasts you can download, or if I say that it's something you can download using podcast catching software. Neither answer would be a proper definition. So, what Socrates and Mino are discussing has implications well beyond just the question of what virtue might be. This is particularly clear when Socrates gives Mino a model of the kind of definition he wants by offering a definition of geometrical figure, which is not an ethical concept. Just as we've seen in previous episodes, Plato uses a discussion of ethics as an opportunity to get into a discussion of knowledge. After several failed attempts to define virtue, Mino admits that he's stumped. He offers an analogy for what Socrates is doing to him. He says that, whereas before talking to Socrates, he felt very confident in discussing virtue, he's now been paralyzed, like someone who's been stung by a stingray. This paralysis is the condition of aporia, or puzzlement, that I mentioned earlier. Socrates remarks that the analogy only applies to him if he's like a stingray who paralyzes himself, since he too is in puzzlement about what virtue might be. At this point, one could imagine the dialogue ending. It would be a much shorter dialogue and a much less interesting one, but it would conform to our expectations of a Socratic dialogue. Socrates meets a confident interlocutor, refutes him, the two are puzzled, the end. But in the case of the Mino, the most interesting part of the dialogue is yet to come. It begins when Mino poses a challenge against the possibility of inquiring into what virtue is, indeed against the possibility of inquiring into anything. The challenge is what we now call Mino's paradox. It goes like this. Either you know something or you don't. If you know it, you don't need to inquire into it, since you already know it. If you don't know it, then you do need to inquire into it, but how can you? After all, you don't know what it is, so how will you go about searching for it, and how will you recognize it if you do come across it? Now, there seems to be an obvious way to steer between the two horns of this dilemma. The paradox assumes that you either know something so well that you don't need to learn any more about it, or you know absolutely nothing at all. But in fact, neither of these is usually the case. After all, I know a fair amount about Buster Keaton. I know that he was a silent film actor, that he made several of the greatest films in cinematic history, like his masterpiece The General, 
that he is famous for not showing emotional reactions in his films, and was therefore nicknamed the Great Stoneface. So I'm not completely ignorant about Buster Keaton, but do I know everything about him so that there's no need for further inquiry? I haven't even seen all his films, because I haven't bothered to sit through all the talkies he appeared in after his time as a silent film comedian. And I certainly don't know, for instance, what his shoe size was, though judging from the shoes he wears in his movies, it was well into the high figures. So, that might be a solution to the paradox. We can know something partially in addition to knowing it completely or not at all. But does that really help? After all, you might ask how we ever got to know anything partially in the first place. Surely we start out not knowing anything. And then we are impaled on the second horn of the dilemma, where we know nothing and have no basis for inquiry. So, there is still a problem here. How, in short, do we get started when we are trying to get knowledge? Perhaps for this reason, Socrates does not try to give the solution I just suggested. He does something more surprising. He tells a kind of religious myth, which he says he's heard from some priests and priestesses. According to this myth, our souls are immortal. They will always exist, and they always have existed. Before our current earthly lives, our souls have already existed for an endless time, and during this endless time, they have learned all there is to know. Thus, we are never in the position of knowing nothing. On the contrary, we always know everything. It's just that we've forgotten most, if not all, the things we knew in our previous existence. It follows that when we seem to be learning new knowledge, we are in fact only being reminded of things we already knew. Now, I know what you're thinking. As promised, that does sound pretty zany. Mino isn't immediately convinced either, so Socrates proceeds to demonstrate his theory. In one of the more famous scenes in the Platonic Dialogues, he summons a slave boy, whose only intellectual qualification is that he knows Greek. Socrates takes the slave boy through a discussion of a geometrical problem, namely finding the length of the side of a square whose area is 8. He gets the boy to guess, and then to see that his guesses are wrong. This induces puzzlement in the boy, the stingray effect. Then Socrates gets the boy to see the right answer, namely that the side of a square of area 8 is the same length as the diagonal of a square whose area is 4. The nifty part is that he does all this only by means of asking questions. It's the most famous example of the famous Socratic method, teaching by asking questions instead of directly imparting information. Though people often complain that Socrates is asking leading questions throughout the scene, it's true enough that he never asserts anything. The slave boy has to figure it out for himself, albeit with the help of Socrates prompting him. Since the boy is able to get to the right answer in this way, without being given the answer from the outside, Socrates concludes that he must have had the knowledge in him all along, just waiting to be brought out by expert questioning. This slave boy sequence ends the presentation of the so-called theory of recollection, probably Plato's most famous doctrine apart from the theory of forms. It's not clear how strongly Plato is committed to the doctrine, though. For one thing, he doesn't exactly work it into every dialogue he writes. It turns up here in the Mino, and occasionally elsewhere, especially in his dialogue The Phaedo, as we'll see in a later episode. Some people, maybe slightly embarrassed by the religious trappings of the doctrine, don't want to take the mythic story about the soul very seriously. They think that Plato is just trying to set out what we would now call a theory of innate knowledge. In other words, he's saying that humans are born with a great deal of knowledge already built in, so to speak. Theories of innateness are still current in contemporary philosophy, for instance in Noam Chomsky's theories about how babies learn language. A lot of linguistic structure, according to him, is already hardwired into our brains from birth. So this way of understanding Plato could help to show that he is relevant to our philosophical concerns today. Now I'm the last to deny that Plato is relevant. For example, in a minute we'll see that this very dialogue, the Mino, introduces a distinction that is still fundamental in philosophy today the distinction between knowledge and true belief. But I don't really think it's right to take the theory of recollection as metaphorically expressing a theory of innateness. For one thing, in the Phaedo the recollection theory is introduced specifically to argue for the immortality of the soul. So, at least in that dialogue, the whole point would be ruined unless the theory really does require the souls existing before we were born. If the theory really asks us to buy into an immortal soul which knows everything and pre-existed our birth, we might wonder whether there is some other, less extravagant way of solving Mino's paradox. Let's go back to a suggestion I made earlier when I was talking about Buster Keaton, that it's possible to have partial knowledge instead of complete knowledge. We saw that that doesn't really help because you need to explain where the partial knowledge comes from. But let's try another solution of the same kind. Could there be some other state which falls between ignorance and knowledge? 
So, for example, could I fall short of knowing what virtue is, while still doing better than total ignorance of virtue? Plato sees that the answer is yes, I could have mere beliefs about virtue. And if those beliefs were true, then that would be better than ignorance, but not as good as certain knowledge. We might even think that Mino himself fits the bill here. He has true beliefs about virtue, for instance that justice is a virtue, but he doesn't know what virtue is. Socrates introduces this idea at the end of the slave boy scene when he says that his questioning has brought out only true beliefs from the boy, but not yet knowledge. To have knowledge, the boy would have to be questioned many times and in different ways. Now it might be our turn to be a bit puzzled. What exactly is the difference between true belief and knowledge? Actually, if I've got true belief, why do I need knowledge? Suppose I have a true belief about who will win tomorrow's horse race. That is just as good a way to win my bet as if I knew the winner for sure. But you might disagree. You might say that if I knew for sure, I'd put down more money on my horse than if I only had a true belief. That seems wrong, though. After all, people can be incredibly confident in their beliefs without having knowledge. Plato, as usual, sees this point, and deals with it later in the dialogue. He has Mino raise exactly the puzzle I just mentioned, namely that true belief is just as good as knowledge. Socrates agrees that it seems like a puzzle, giving the example of knowing how to get to another Greek city called Larissa. If I have a true belief about the right way to get there, that will get me there just as well as knowledge. But then he seems to change his mind, and decides that true belief really is inferior to knowledge. The problem with true belief is that it isn't grounded in a good reason for the belief. Like I just said, it's our ability to give a good reason, and not our degree of confidence, that makes our true beliefs into knowledge. In another famous image, Socrates compares true beliefs to magical statues which run away unless tied down. In the same way, our true beliefs are unreliable unless they are tied down by finding the reason for their truth. One aspect of this unreliability is that people who only have true belief and not knowledge may be unable to impart the truth to other people. That's suggested at least by some further reflections in the Mino on the subject of whether virtue can be taught. That was, after all, the initial question of the dialogue, and it remains important throughout. In between the slave boy scene and the discussion of true belief, Mino and Socrates speculate that virtue would be teachable if it were a kind of knowledge. This rings some Socratic bells. As we've seen in previous episodes, Socrates was notorious for thinking that virtue is knowledge. But if virtue were knowledge and were thus teachable, shouldn't there be people around who teach it? This is the cue for the entrance of Anaitis. As I said earlier, he is one of the men who had Socrates indicted for corrupting the youth and introducing novel gods. In this scene, we get a glimpse of why he might have done so. Socrates asks Anaitis whether he supposes that there are people who can teach virtue. The obvious candidates are the sophists. As we saw in another episode, some sophists claim to teach virtue in return for money. But Anaitis has nothing but scorn for the sophists. He says one is better off asking any Athenian citizen if one wants to learn virtue. Socrates counters by reeling off a whole list of famous Athenian statesmen, like Pericles, who were clearly virtuous, but had vicious sons. If being virtuous makes you able to teach virtue, wouldn't these men have taught virtue to their own sons? That's enough to make Anaitis furious. He makes the none-too-subtle parting remark that Socrates should watch his step, since the city is apt to mistreat him if he doesn't mind his manners. But this, of course, is no answer to Socrates' latest puzzle. If virtue is knowledge, as Socrates typically claims, then why are there no teachers of it? Here, true belief might come to the rescue. The virtuous men might be the ones who have true beliefs about what to do, rather than knowledge. Socrates even suggests that such men are given their beliefs by divine dispensation, given that they haven't done the philosophical work required to ground their beliefs in good reason, or whatever it is that makes a true belief knowledge. Now, here in the Mino, Plato doesn't say in any further detail what you would have to do to turn true beliefs into knowledge. But we should give him credit for discovering a problem that still obsesses philosophers today. He's right that true belief is not the same thing as knowledge. After all, suppose I just believe anything anyone tells me. That would get me a lot of true beliefs, but also a lot of false ones. And it seems obvious that none of the beliefs I got this way would count as knowledge. On the other hand, it seems equally obvious that true belief has some close relation to knowledge. If I know something, then I must believe it, and it must be true. The question is then what you need to add to true belief in order to make knowledge. This question dominates the platonic work we'll be looking at next, 
a dialogue that takes up the problems of the Mino and carries them a good deal further. Those of you who spend time with children will know that between the adults and the children of this world, a war is raging. Skirmishes in this war are fought across the land, every morning, and both sides use all the weapons at their disposal, tantrums, the silent treatment, withheld treats, even in extreme cases, the naughty step. I am speaking, of course, about the question of how warmly to dress. The children's perspective on this issue is well entrenched. It is not nearly as cold outside as you parents would claim, and we aren't going to wear that winter coat, though we may be willing to consider a light sweater. The parents' point of view is equally firm. You'll catch your death of cold. Now, I guess that most of the people listening to this podcast are above the age of 12, and so naturally favor the adult perspective. There is, we quite naturally think, a fact of the matter about how cold it is outside. Just look at the thermometer. Yet the children can turn to us and say, but I don't feel cold, so for me it isn't cold. And they've got a point, albeit a point which is undermined slightly when they start shivering, even as they're insisting on how warm it is. The point is that it is for each person to say how cold the air feels to them. You might even say that, whatever the temperature may be, the air's being cold is nothing more than the air's seeming cold to each of us. This prompts an unsettling thought. It's not implausible that the air is really neither cold nor hot in itself, but is cold for you and warm for me. I grew up in Boston, so I'm made of tougher stuff than you are. And we can think of other cases. Most of us have been in disputes about whether a certain piece of clothing is blue or green, and maybe it is just green for one person, blue for someone else. Thus, the unsettling thought, what if everything is like this? Suppose that there is no truth apart from the way things seem to each person. Things may be warm for me, cold for you, blue for me, green for you, good for me, bad for you, while having none of these features in themselves. In that case, nothing is true absolutely, rather, truth is relative. Something might be true for me and false for you, but neither false nor true in itself. This relativist theory of truth is one that still arises in contemporary philosophy, but it has its roots in the dialogues of Plato. In particular, it is explored in my very favorite Platonic dialogue, the Theaetetus. In a few previous episodes, I've mentioned the word epistemology, which means the study of knowledge, because the ancient Greek word for knowledge or understanding was episteme. We saw last week that Plato's Mino has quite a bit to say about epistemology, and we found interesting epistemological ideas already in the pre-Socratics. But the first work to devote itself fully to epistemology is the Theaetetus. It explores some of the ideas of the Mino, but goes well beyond them, investigating not only this relativist theory of truth, but also the question of how false judgment is possible and how knowledge relates to belief. The main characters are our old friend Socrates, Theodorus, a mathematician, and a young man who is a mathematician like Theodorus and profoundly ugly like Socrates. He shares Socrates' protruding eyes and snub nose. This is Theaetetus, one of the most admirable characters ever to engage with Socrates in Plato's dialogues. Despite his youth, he shows much more commitment to the philosophical search than the older Theodorus. He offers several attempts at saying what knowledge might be. As we have come to expect in Socratic dialogues, each attempt is refuted, but he doesn't lose heart, and we learn a great deal about knowledge in the course of the dialogue, even if the characters fail to produce a definition of knowledge that satisfies them. Theaetetus's first attempt is to say that knowledge is perception. The word for perception here is aesthesis, which incidentally is where we get the word aesthetics. It can mean sense perception, that is, vision, hearing, smell, and so on, or more broadly, any kind of perception, including the perception of things with the mind. Especially if we take it in this broader sense, Theaetetus's definition looks plausible. We know something when we perceive it. Or perhaps one might say, we know when we grasp that something is the case. But Socrates shows that Theaetetus' definition could be taken in a more unsettling way. If knowledge is perception, then whatever seems to me to be the case must actually be the case for me. Here he gives the same example I used a moment ago. The wind seems warm to me and cold to you, so I perceive the wind as warm and you perceive it as cold. If perception is knowledge, then that means that I know the wind is warm and you know it is cold. How could this be? Well, only if truth is relative. It's true for me that the wind is warm, and true for you that it is cold, but there is no such thing as the wind's being truly warm or cold in itself, relative to no perceiver. After all, knowledge is nothing but perception. Socrates adds that, in putting forward such a view, Theaetetus would be in good company, 
In particular, this relativistic theory of truth was asserted by the great sophist Protagoras. As we saw in our previous episode on the sophists, Protagoras was famous for saying, Man is the measure of all things, of the things that are that they are, of the things that are not that they are not. Like Theaetetus' definition of knowledge as perception, this man is the measure doctrine could be taken in a lot of different ways. But Socrates wants us to take both claims as boiling down to relativism about truth. If I am the measure of whether the wind is warm, then there is nothing more to the wind's being warm than its being warm for me and not cold for me. The way things seem to me determines the way the wind is and isn't for me. But wait, there's more. Socrates adds that Theaetetus and Protagoras have another heavy hitter on their side, namely the pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus. You might remember that when I talked about Heraclitus, I said that Plato portrays his illustrious predecessor as believing in a doctrine of total flux. That is, everything is constantly changing in every respect, and there is no stability in us or the world around us. The Theaetetus isn't the only dialogue where Plato ascribes this view to Heraclitus, though it is the most famous example. But why does the flux doctrine go along with relativism about truth? This is a slightly complicated question, but the basic answer is that if Protagorean relativism is true, then the things in the world around us will have no stable natures from moment to moment. They will only be whatever they seem to be to various perceivers, and this is changing all the time, according to Heraclitus as he's presented here. So, on this view, it would turn out that nothing is cold and nothing is warm. Rather, everything is always changing in every way. Actually, it might be even worse than this. If we say that what is changing from warm to cold or vice versa is both warm and cold, then the air will always be both warm and cold. It was with this in mind that Aristotle later accused Heraclitus of denying the principle of non-contradiction. These radical consequences of the flux doctrine give us plenty of reason for rejecting it, and if buying into the relativist theory of truth means buying into the flux theory, then maybe we'll give up on relativism as well. But Protagoras will try to persuade us that the relativist theory isn't as implausible as it seems. If you're interested in which things are good, then obviously what you're interested in is which things are good for you. What would it even mean for something to be good but not for you or for anyone in particular? This perhaps connects the theory Plato is considering to the real historical Protagoras. He claimed to teach virtue, and may have supposed this was possible because the good is the advantageous, and that he could teach you how to get things you would consider to be advantageous, like political power. Whether Protagoras really held the radical epistemological theory that Plato ascribes to him here in the Theaetetus is of course another matter, but let's leave that aside, and also leave aside the problems about flux, and just consider the problem of how to refute someone who adopts the relativist position on truth. Now I know what you're thinking. This will be easy. Just point to a thermometer, which tells us an objective fact about how cold the air is, but not so fast. Firstly, Protagoras can agree with your kids that whatever the thermometer says, it's up to each of us to say whether it is cold or warm for us. Secondly, he can point out that the thermometer is itself something you perceive. If it seems to you that the thermometer reads, say, 30 degrees, then it's true for you that the thermometer reads 30 degrees. It's true for you simply because you perceive it to be the case. To insist on there being an absolute truth about the reading of the thermometer is just to assume that there is a truth independent of any perceiver, and that's what Protagoras denies. Man is the measure of all things, right? But Socrates has a couple of other tricks up his sleeve. He starts with abuse. Wouldn't it be just as true to say that a pig or a baboon is the measure of all things? Abuse is always satisfying, of course, but this argument doesn't carry much weight. Fortunately, he has more philosophically satisfying points to make, too. For instance, on this man-is-the-measure doctrine, there'd be no point consulting experts. Why pay to go to the doctor if you are just as good a measure as the doctor is? If it seems to you that taking aspirin will cure that nasty bout of appendicitis, then it's true for you. This sounds like a theory that will reduce the life expectancy of its adherents, reason enough to reject it. Closely related is an objection about predicting the future. If I expect to recover from my illness, then it will be true for me that I will recover. If it then later seems to me that I'm still sick, then it will seem to me that I have not recovered, and so it will be true for me that I didn't recover. It's hard to see how both of these could be the case. But Socrates' most interesting objection illustrates a classic, perennially useful philosophical maneuver. Whenever you're presented with a bold new theory, especially a skeptical theory, ask whether the theory could be true on its own terms. For example, if someone says that nothing is true, you can ask him whether this claim is itself true. 
Or if someone says that language is meaningless, you can ask him how he is able to convey this idea in a sentence. In the same way, Socrates suggests that Protagoras's relativism doctrine is self-refuting. For, even if Protagoras agrees with the doctrine, Socrates does not. Thus, it will be true for Socrates that Protagoras's doctrine is false. Indeed, since this follows from Protagoras's doctrine, it will even be true for Protagoras that for Socrates the doctrine is false. Thus, Protagoras is bound by his own doctrine to admit that his doctrine is false. But maybe this trick is a bit too tricky. Even if Protagoras has to admit that the doctrine is false for Socrates, he doesn't have to admit that it's false in itself, or really false. Remember, according to him, there's no such thing as something's just really being false or true. There's only something's being false or true to you, to me, to Socrates. Before we get any dizzier, let's leave relativism behind and move on to another major theme of this dialogue, the possibility of false belief. This theme arises when Theotetus accepts that knowledge is not, after all, perception, and makes another suggestion. Perhaps knowledge is having a true belief. After all, when I know something, I have a belief about it, and obviously it can't be a false belief, so why not say I know something when I have a true belief about it? All well and good, says Socrates, but if we want to uphold this definition, we need to understand how it could be that some beliefs are true and others false. And here we will run afoul of those pesky sophists again. Some sophists suggested that it is impossible to say or believe anything false, in which case everything is just a matter of persuasion. This challenge appears in several Platonic dialogues. We've already seen it arising in the Euthydemus, but the Theotetus is again probably the most famous case. The argument here for the sophistical view is rather reminiscent of Mino's paradox, which we looked at last time. It goes like this. Either I know something or I don't. If I know about it, then I won't make a mistake about it, thanks to my knowledge. But if I don't know about it, then I can't think about it, so I won't be able to make a mistake then either. In other words, I'll have either perfect knowledge of each thing, or no knowledge of it at all, and in neither case will I get things wrong. So it's impossible to make a mistake, to believe anything false. As with Mino's paradox, it looks like the way out is to say that there is some middle ground where I know or grasp something well enough to make a mistake about it, but not so well that I am immune to error. Socrates presents two analogies to suggest how this could work. First, he says, imagine that your memory is like a wax tablet, the kind they used to write on in ancient Greece. When you perceive something, that's like a stamp making an impression in the wax of your mind. Some people have tough, dirty wax and are slow on the uptake, others have fluid wax and get impressions quickly, but lose them just as fast. Others have wax which is ideally suited, easily stamped, but also good at holding the impressions. Quite a nice image of how memory works, really. Okay, so now for false judgment. That would happen when there is a mismatch between something you perceive and an existing impression in the wax of your memory. For instance, I think I am watching a silent film starring Buster Keaton. But actually, I'm confused. That lovable fellow on the screen is in fact Charlie Chaplin, and I'm matching the visual image to the wrong stamped impression in my wax tablet. As Socrates says, it's like putting your right foot into your left shoe. Notice that this solves the sophistical dilemma. I can make a mistake about something because in a way I know it, and in a way I don't. I know who Buster Keaton is because I must have got acquainted with him to have an impression of him in my memory, but this doesn't guarantee that I'll be error-free in identifying people as Buster Keaton. This is a compelling analogy, and for once the proposal isn't exactly rejected in the dialogue. Rather, the characters realize that even if it works for cases of mistaken identity and perception, there are many cases of false judgment where it will not help. For instance, what is going on when I add 7 and 5 and get 11? There's nothing here about impressions being made on our memory by perception, and yet I've still made a mistake. So Socrates produces another image in place of the wax tablet. Imagine, he says, that your soul is like an aviary, a bird cage, with lots of birds flying around in it, each of which represents a piece of knowledge. Whenever you've learned something, you've acquired a bird and put it into your aviary. What happens when you add 5 to 7 and get 11 is that you reach into your aviary and pull out the 11 bird instead of the 12 bird. Again, your knowledge of 11 actually enables you to make the mistake, the way your knowledge of Buster Keaton enabled you to mistake Charlie Chaplin for him. But Socrates and Theaetetus decide that this model too is problematic. It means that when you make a mistake, it is precisely by virtue of knowing that you get things wrong. It is paradoxically because of your knowledge of 11 that you are able to have a false belief about 5 plus 7. 
The indefatigable Theotetus has another suggestion, though. What if your aviary contains birds representing ignorance as well as birds representing knowledge? Then, when you make a mistake, you've just grabbed the wrong kind of bird. But that ruins the whole point, which was to explain how we can know something just enough to make a mistake about it without knowing it so well that we are immune to error. So, where does all that leave us? Right back where we started, without a general account of false belief, but still thinking that maybe knowledge is the same thing as true belief. Ah, but it isn't, says Socrates. Just consider the case of a jury. They might be persuaded by some fancy lawyer that a certain man is innocent of a crime. And the man really is innocent. But we wouldn't say that the jury knows, since they only believe this because the lawyer was slick enough to persuade them. Thus, they have a true belief, but not knowledge. So much for that definition. Yet, Theotetus still feels, and today's epistemologists tend to agree, that knowledge must have something to do with true belief. Maybe knowledge is true belief plus something else as well. Something the jurors are lacking, but which you would have if you were, say, an eyewitness at the murder and know that the accused man is innocent. It's no easy task to say what that would be. As I say, modern-day epistemologists are still struggling with the question of how knowledge relates to true belief. In so doing, they are taking up a challenge first thrown down here in the Theotetus. For the rest of the dialogue, Socrates and Theotetus explore the possibility that some kind of rational account, a logos, that favorite word of Heraclitus, is what you'd need to add to true belief to render it into knowledge. As we expect by now, they don't manage to make this work. And yet we do learn a bit more about knowledge, in particular how it does and does not relate to giving an account of yourself when you believe something. This last part of the dialogue is sufficiently complicated that giving an account of it would be no easy matter, and I'm just about out of time anyway, so I'll close there for now.